Welcome back, everybody, to our third installment in Chapter 20, Redox. Today, we are going to talk about uh, what are oxidation numbers. Sometimes they're called oxidation states. It's really the same thing. The oxidation numbers are positive or negative numbers that indicate the amount of oxidation or reduction that an atom has gone through. How much electron gaining has that atom done? Or how much electron losing has that atom done? So when you say it that way, do you mean like how many electrons an atom has gained and how many it has lost? Because right. that's going to affect yes. the charge. Okay. Okay, um, so if an oxidation number is positive, that means that it has lost electrons, and that means that it's oxidation has occurred. Mm -hmm. right? On the other side of that, if the oxidation number is negative, then again, it had to gain those electrons, which meaning a reduction has occurred. Again, think back to oil rig. <laughs> oxidation is the loss of electrons, so you get something that's positive, and uh, reduction is gain, so you're getting something that's negative. And again, for the bazillionth time that we've probably said this in class, electrons are negative, which is why reduction is gain actually makes perfect sense. So when we're assigning oxidation numbers, there are some rules to follow for that. And a lot of it goes back to where the element is on the periodic table and how many valence electrons it has so that we can figure out what's being lost or gained. In order to satisfy that octet rule. But it's, it's all of these, all these things keep piling back on each other. That's why chemistry is so hard. Chemistry is not hard. It's, it's so easy. But you said something. You said octet rule. Yeah. And that's in the covalent bonding chapter, which we may or may not have gotten to by the time you see this, because we kind of switched up the order this year. I've been, I've been talking about that since chapter six. I've been throwing that out there. And, and they know it. They, well, that's good. That's, that's great. So we know the octet rule, uh, atoms want to have eight electrons in their valence shell. So the nice thing about these monatomic ions, one atom ions, is that uh, the oxidation number is the same as its charge. That's the simplest thing. Here, second rule for the oxidation numbers is that the oxidation number of hydrogen in most compounds is a positive one except for when it forms a metal hydride. In those cases, it's going to be a negative one. Well, how do you know it's a metal hydride? Well, it's hydrogen combined with a metallic element. If you see a chemical formula that says NaH, well, sodium is a metal, this is a metal hydride. And hydrogen, you'll notice, can be both positive or negative. You also know that it's kind of misplaced on the periodic table. Hydrogen is over there in column one with all of those very reactive metals, the ones that fizz and explode and catch fire in water. And yet hydrogen is a non-metal. Uh, hydrogen can act like a metal and lose valence electrons, or it can act like a non-metal and gain valence electrons. So even though this is following rule number one, hydrogen gets its own special metal because it can do both things. Another special mention happens with oxygen as well. An oxidation number of oxygen is almost always negative two, uh, except for when it forms peroxides. In that case, it's a negative one. Or when it bonds with fluorine. And in that case, it's really crazy and it becomes a positive two. And why does that happen? Why positive two instead of negative two? Fluorine is the greediest element on the entire periodic table. It has, if you remember way back to chapter 6, it has the highest electronegativity. It is going to pull electrons from everybody. So oxygen, in that case, has no choice but to give electrons to fluorine. The oxidation number for any free element, an element, is zero. It's neutral. Right, so that's an element by itself, not bonded to anything. Yes. Not bonded to any other elements. Right, right, because we know about our friend Claire Brewster mm -hmm. and those uh, Magic 7, the diatomic elements, and then there's some other weird things like sulfur that can form S8 and uh, phosphorus that can form a multi-atom, but they're all phosphoruses. Uh, ions. So if it's just that element, 
the oxidation number is going to be zero. Hey, one other thing to keep in mind is that if you have a neutral compound, meaning there's no positive or negative charge on that compound, uh, when you add up all of those oxidation numbers, so all of those positive and negative numbers in the, in the atom, it must also equal zero. So if it's a zero neutral charge, you have a sum of a zero for your oxidation numbers. Mr. Sustin, can you give us an example of that happening in an ionic compound? And in a covalent compound? Well, in the, in the previous slideshow, mm -hmm. we were working with sodium chloride. And you have sodium ions, which we know from knowing about their valence electrons and the octet rule and whatnot, that sodium ions have a plus one charge. And we know that chloride ions have gained the electron that sodium lost, and they have a negative one charge. Those two charges, positive one plus a negative one, equals zero. And what happens when you put that sodium chloride in water? It dissolves. Okay, and that forms some salt water. Yeah. And water is a covalently bonded compound that happens to be made of hydrogen and oxygen, both atoms following their normal uh, oxidation state with hydrogen being plus one, and oxygen being minus two. And we know that oxygen gets to be the negative, uh, gets the negative oxidation state in that example, because oxygen is further to the right and up on the periodic table. It has the higher electronegativity. So you need to go back and refer to your trends from the periodic table chapter. The element with the higher electronegativity uh, wants to attract electrons more than the one with the lower electronegativity in a bond. So the higher electronegativity, that atom gets the negative oxidation state, but it's still going to cancel out to zero. All right, our sixth and final rule to follow when we're assigning oxidation numbers has to deal with those polyatomic ions. Uh, so those ions that contain obviously more than one atom. For example, sulfate, SO4 minus two. When you have that, the sum of your oxidation numbers has to equal the charge or the ionic charge of that polyatomic ion. So unlike the neutral compound, where it's summed up to zero, in a polyatomic ion, for example, sulfate, SO4 minus two, the charge, the sum of your oxidation numbers has to equal that negative two charge. Okay, we're gonna look at a few examples here. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to do this. Please don't let those rules freak you out. Once you do this a few times, if you go back and look at where the elements are compared to the periodic table, and you know how many valence electrons they have, which we can see in class that you're already good, it's really easy to figure this out. So let's look at a first example for sodium oxide. We write that as Na2O. And there's a reason that we need two sodiums to react with oxygen. And that's because of the common oxidation state of sodium, which is plus one. And the common oxidation state of oxygen, which is minus two. If we put those two things together in a compound, uh, it has to balance out to zero. We have a rule that tells us that. And we use our mad algebra skills uh, and figure out that we need two of the plus one things to cancel out one of the minus two things to get to zero. Yeah, that's okay. it. We can do another one, a slightly different. Uh, here are two nonmetals bonded together in a compound called ammonia. It's NH3. You look at hydrogen. Is hydrogen combined with a metal? No. no. Nitrogen is a nonmetal. So hydrogen in this case is going to have a plus one charge, as usual. And we have three of them. So three times positive one gives you a grand total of a positive three charge. And we only have one nitrogen. So in order to make this compound neutral, nitrogen, the one nitrogen, must be negative three. Now, that should make sense, though, because well, if you look at nitrogen. On the periodic table? Yeah. Over there in group five? Well, if it's in group five, it has five valence electrons. In order to have a full octet, it needs to gain three electrons, which would make its charge negative three. Right. It all comes together. 
and hydrogen has one valence electron to lose. Okay, our next example is the sulfate that Mr. Shar was mentioning before, so take it away. Excellent. <laughs> All right, well, remember sulfate, as I mentioned, was SO4 with a negative 2 charge. So right away, you need to know that since it's a polyatomic ion, it's going to end up equaling, when you add up all of your oxidation numbers, negative 2. Uh, so go back to those rules we were referring to. We know that oxygen has a negative 2 charge uh, most commonly. So if I have four oxygens with a negative 2 charge, I have a negative Negative eight. Negative eight. <laughs> you guys are giving me weird yeah. looks here. I have a negative eight. So then I also have one sulfur. So if I have a negative eight on my oxygen, and I know I'm going to end up with a negative two overall charge, what does that leave me with with my sulfur? X minus eight equals negative, negative, negative two. two. Sulfur X positive six. Right. And you know what? That's really cool, because if we look at sulfur on the periodic table right under oxygen, we might have first thought, oh, it should have a minus 2 also. But sulfur has a lower electronegativity, so oxygen gets to be the negative one, and sulfur has six valence electrons. It doesn't always work that way, uh, but a lot of times it does. Sulfur with six valence electrons is going to be plus six uh, to cancel out the four oxygens at minus 2 each, we end up with a minus two charge overall. Yeah. And now we have two more compounds. <laughs> yes, we have two different varieties of iron containing compounds. We have iron chloride that's FeCl2 and we have an iron chloride that is FeCl3. How is that possible? Well, iron as it happens can lose some of those D shell electrons. Oh, snap. It's one of those those transition D block elements. So right. it's got the S orbitals and D craziness. So it, it, yeah, it could be a couple different things. So if iron loses just the S the S orbital electrons, the 4S2, if it loses just those two valence electrons, which is going to do because it's a metal, then it's going to have a plus two charge, a plus two oxidation state. We know chlorine is way over in the halogen column, one away from the octet. Uh, it desperately wants to gain one valence electron. It likes to be minus one. But if iron's giving up two valence electrons, we need to have two chlorine atoms around to uh, gobble up those two valence electrons and make that a neutral compound. But when you get to iron three, then you can throw in that D block electron as well. It's going to go, it's going to lose 4s2, and then it's going to lose that sixth 3d electron, which is going to knock it down to 3d5, which Ooh, is that, that that's that nice little stability plateau, which makes perfect sense that it would feel free to lose that third electron. And so now we have an iron that has a plus 3 charge. And for the same reasons Mrs. Gregory said with the chlorine, now we need three chlorines in order to neutralize the positive three charge from this new variety of iron ions. And when all is said and done, our positive three plus our three minus ones is going to balance out to a zero again. So we've given you here some examples, a, a little bit of all the rules that you're going to see, and you're going to be doing a lot of practice in class. By that, we mean a lot and a lot of practice. And that's going to set you up for our chapter on formulas and nomenclature. So you're going to be fluent in writing these chemical formulas. That's where we're going to apply all our knowledge of oxidation number rules uh, to make these compounds write their formulas correctly. And then we'll see how they interact when we get into chemical reactions. Thank you very much for watching. And make sure you respond as per your homework uh, requirement here. And study up for this test coming up.